So welcome to addressing the recovery support needs of persons with intellectual and developmental, uh, I like to say differences. All right, so key purpose, for the purpose of this presentation, IDD will stand for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and related sensory processing disorders with or without co-occurring mental health and or substance use diagnosis. So key objectives, define intellectual and developmental disabilities, identify different potential support needs of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, including vital support needs around sensory processing disorders, like, tact like tactile dysfunction and proprioceptive dysfunction. And we'll get into that here in a little bit. And execute a more trauma-informed and person-centered approach interacting with persons with proprioceptive dysfunction and or tactile dysfunction. So what are intellectual and developmental disabilities? So according to Eunice Kennedy, to the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, intellectual and developmental disabilities is defined as differences that are usually present at birth and that uniquely affect the trajectory of the individual's physical, intellectual, and or emotional development. Many of these conditions affect multiple body parts or systems. I actually had a hand in this definition this was something that I sent them because their last one um, was not as person-centered or trauma-informed because the thing you have to understand is when you're talking about IDD and you say intellectual and developmental disabilities, a, key, a synonym for disability is disabled and another synonym for disabled is broken and people with IDD are not broken. They just happen to have differences that in certain environments, they need extra support. So what are some examples of intellectual and developmental disabilities? So ADHD. And this is a big one, because a lot of people assume ADHD is mental health. But within the DSM, ADHD is actually classified as a neuro de neurodevelopmental disorder. Asperger's included in, which is now included in the autism spectrum disorders in the DSM, autism spectrum disorders. And the, the reason I keep this separate is I understand the whole point of, you know, Asperger's is technically named after a Nazi scientist. Um, so they were trying to be trauma informed. But I also know there are people with Asperger's that that's how they identify. And then there are people with autism that strongly identify that there's a difference between Asperger's and autism. And so I just keep it separate. Cerebral palsy, Chunk-Jansen syndrome, which is one of the genetic syndromes I have. Dysgraphia dyslexia. So uh, who knows the difference between dysgraphia and dyslexia? So dysgraphia has to do with writing. Dyslexia has to do with reading. Just thought I'd point that out. So proprioceptive dysfunction. So this is issues with body awareness and understanding one's position in space. So people with proprioceptive dysfunction, they exhibit seeking and or avoiding behaviors attributed to proprioceptive sensory signals. So example would be bear hugs. And we get in more in depth into this here in a little bit. Tactile dysfunction. So people with tactile dysfunction feel certain sensations more strongly than most people do or differently. Uh, they can exhibit seeking and or avoiding behaviors attributed to tactile sensory signals. Example, one example would be tickling. So written expression disorder. <clears throat> this is not a made up term. 
even though it may not it, even though it may sound like that so people who have written expression disorder struggle to put their ideas into writing. They also make frequent mistakes in grammar and punctuation. Written expression disorder often co-occurs with other learning challenges. Two of the most common are dyslexia and ADHD. And the important thing to understand about written expression disorder is people don't outgrow written expression disorder. It's lifelong and caused by differences in the brain. And I bring this one up because those of you who are peer specialists like me, um, I know there are a lot of people that encourage journaling. One of the most traumatizing things you can do to a person with, with written expression disorder is try and get them to journal. Um, that is not... Uh, helpful because the issue is expressing we can express ourselves very well verbally but when it comes to written expression we struggle and so trying to suggest that we do something that we struggle with to try and cope does not help so oops all done here we go. All right, so what are some examples of possible support needs? So only one person talking at a time. So for some people with IDD, including myself, what happens when two or more people talk is it becomes very overstimulating and it becomes difficult. The more the people are talking at the same time, the more voices we have to try and filter and figure out who's saying what, the more overstimulating it gets. And for some of us, um, like myself, being overstimulated is very overwhelming. And so it's a, a lot easier for me when I'm attending trainings, that when we have one person talking at a time so that I'm able to follow along with everything that's being said. Only one subject matter presented at a time. So as you may or may not be aware of, some people with IDD have a delay in processing information. And so if you're just constantly jumping topics, it can be very difficult for that person to follow along uh, coherently. Use of visual aids. Uh, so for some people with IDD, including myself, we are very visual learners. So having a visual aid is can be very helpful. And I'll actually have a couple of examples here in a minute. Communication assistance. Okay, so let's talk about this one because this is kind of a broad topic. So as far as communication assistance, this can look many different ways. One way communication assistance can look is being patient with people that use speech generating devices to type out what they are wanting to say and let them hit enter uh, instead of trying to assume what they are trying to say because they want to be heard just like everyone else. And whenever you're not taking the time to be patient and listen to be, they want to be listened to be heard, not listen to be responded to. And so um, I, I have a few uh, personal experiences of um, having to work on this myself Um because I did work with some people that use speech generating devices in a pilot. Uh, and I did not understand that trying to finish what they're saying bothered them. And so thankfully they were very gracious and understanding that, you know, not everyone has that experience. And so, you know, they were gracious enough to speak up but also gracious enough to allow me time to adapt. 
And so that's kind of the biggest thing I have learned as far as um, communicating with people that use speech generating devices. The other, another form of communication assistance is not everyone with intellectual and developmental um, disabilities communicates verbally. Um, sometimes they communicate by their actions. Um, for example, my best friend uh, since sixth grade has Down syndrome and he's a, he can say my name and but he can't like have full conversation. But the way I know when he's ready for uh, food, when we're hanging out, as ridiculous as this may sound, he flaps his arms like chicken wings because his favorite food is chicken. And then when he's ready for me to go home, even though I'm like twice his size, I have a bed in his room um, cause I have a twin XL bed and he has a twin bed cause sometimes I'll spend the night and, uh, when he's ready for me to go home, he'll try and pull me out of my bed. Or if I'm wearing my sandals and not my leg braces, he'll actually grab my sandals and put them on my feet and then turn the TV off. So just keep in mind that when we're talking about communication assistance, it's supporting people and how they communicate. And sometimes that's not always verbally. Sometimes that's by action. Written list of directions or tasks. So for some people with IDD, uh, uh, and uh, I'm kind of speaking for myself on this one, uh, especially because of my ADHD, uh, it can be kind of frustrating if someone expects me to do a long list of things or do something a very specific way if they don't write it down for me. Because if they have a specific way they want it done, but then they're not providing the support, it gets frustrating because then I don't do it the way they want it done. And then they get frustrated because they think I'm not paying attention. And then I'm getting frustrated because obviously I missed some kind of crucial step that to me may not have been that big of a deal or vice versa. To me, it was a huge deal. And to them, it's not that big of a deal. Um, and so, you know, it's just communication is the key really when it when it comes to supporting people with intellectual and developmental differences, just like, just like key uh, communication is key when supporting people with mental health and substance use and other um, challenges. And then specific activities, strategies when dealing with proprioceptive dysfunction and or tactile dysfunction and their associated seeking behaviors and or avoiding behaviors. And we'll get into that here in a moment. All right, so now we're at the point of visual aid examples. So let me switch over to my, whoops, sorry. My bad. Uh. Here we go. Hold on. I had it up, but then it disappeared. Uh, let's do this. All right, do y'all see a worksheet now or do y'all still see PowerPoint? We see, a we see the worksheet. Okay, cool. Because again, I don't, uh, I wish Zoom would quit changing stuff on us when they do updates so I could know for sure how to do certain things. 
but that's okay. We'll just roll with it. It's technology. All right. So this is a worksheet I actually created. Um, and I actually, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I actually have a recording of the presentation that goes with this worksheet that I can put in the chat here in a little bit, or I'll share it with, uh, Jessica and make sure it gets sent out to everyone that's interested. So I developed a worksheet to that can be used. And ironically, the the original intent was to create something that could help support people with IDD learn how to advocate for themselves in different environments. But I ended up doing it in a way that it works for others as well. So it's not just specifically a tool for people with disabilities. It can also be a tool for others. Um, so we kind of talk about what self-awareness is, and then I give my definition of support needs, um, which is uh, support needs are types of assistance or devices needed in order to participate as independently as possible in the community at large, including but not limited to being able to fulfill job duties with as much independence as possible, fulfill educational requirements for degrees or trainings, and ability to participate in social interactions without feeling isolated. And then we talk about what our strengths, and there's definition, what our challenges, there's definition, there's a box for them to identify their strengths and challenges. And then we talk about personality traits. And then we go into the four steps of using self-awareness to advocate for support needs in, in any given environment. And then there's an example for them to look at what it looks like in the work environment work environment, college academic environment, and social environment. And then there's a pay a box for them to practice. And I actually got this copyrighted with the U.S. Copyrights Office, which was a very interesting process. And we'll just leave it at that. All right. So I am going to attempt to show a video now. Um, I will show this first so y'all kind of maybe understand what we're about to watch. What do y'all see right now? PowerPoint or worksheet? I think this is PowerPoint. It's Does it have a blue background? Yeah, example of Okay. Needs. All right. So then what I want to do is thank you. So I need to drag this over now so that it becomes. So now y'all see Google Chrome, right? Yes. Okay. And yes. then if I have to, if I have to stop my share and start again, so y'all can hear the video, I will. It's just Zoom is throwing me this morning with the most recent update. So what I am showing y'all right now is called let me go back to the PowerPoint so I can cite this correctly. It's called the Incredible Five Point Scale, and it was developed by Carrie Dunn, Baron, and Mitzi Curtis. And we're actually going to be watching an interview or part of an interview with Carrie Dunn, Baron, that uh, she does a really great way of explaining this tool she created. But I thought I would kind of give y'all a quick crash course so that maybe the little bit of the interview we watch it'll make a little more sense so it's called the incredible five point scale and she created this as a way to help teach certain skills um to persons with idd but also as a way for people with idd to be able to communicate where they're at like uh for example this is mine that we're looking at for when I'm at work and I'm struggling, I uh, struggle with anxiety sometimes. And so kind of what has been found is it's in some instances, 
easier for someone with IDD to communicate a number. And I'm speaking from personal experience, as well as, you know, kind of highlighting what Carrie says in her interview. Um, um, it's easier to communicate a number. And if you're able to put that into a chart like this diagram and share it with your supporters, then you can check in with them and they know how, where you are, because that's what this first column is, is what it looks and sounds like. And then the middle column is what it feels like. So this is internal. So external environment, what it looks like externally, what it looks like internally. And then this would be coping mechanisms to try. And the whole goal is to try to get down at least one level. So like if you're at a two, you want to get to a one. If you're at a five, you want to at least get to a four. Um, does that make sense before we start the video? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, totally. Thanks for sharing that. Okay. All right. Well, let's see what Zoom decides to do now when that I'm ready. I'm going to hit play, let it run for a few seconds, and then I'm going to ask if y'all heard the sound. But first, I'm going to turn up the volume. Thank you very much. It's thrilled to have you here. Do y'all hear the volume? Yes. Okay, then I will put it in full screen now. So um, the incredible five-point scale, which I'm just going to point out, most of the rim of it is green, you guys. That's why it, it's see-through because it we shoot on yes. a green screen. Uh, <laughs> but so uh, this, you, it's a system that you developed with your colleague, Bitsy Curtis. Can you tell us what ideas and research contributed to the development of the five-point scale? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, the idea is that we were looking at um, the traditional or the most common autism learning styles, um, such as the vis using visuals um, to learn, not being a, a learning strength, uh, whereas a lot of auditory input and language concepts seem to be less of a strength. And Simon Baron Cohen from Cambridge University uh, developed a learning theory that he called hypersystemizing and hypo-emotionalizing. And by that he meant that most individuals with, on the autism spectrum seem to learn best through systems and had more difficulty learning through um, emotional language. So what we started doing was taking um, social and emotional concepts that we were trying to teach and put them on a scale. So everything got broken into five parts, whether it was voice volume or um, stress, um, uh, personal distance, um, language, uh, swearing, um, that kind of thing. So no matter what it was, we could just take that concept, that idea, and break it into five parts. So we're teaching social and emotional um, concepts and ideas to people who otherwise have difficulty grasping them or understanding. Um, yeah, so that was it. And we started with the uh, voice scale, um, trying to teach a middle school boy uh, that in the hallway while passing, you needed to use number three voice. Rather than telling him he was too loud, or he needed to talk softer, those felt very judging to him, and he responded poorly to those prompts. So instead, we found that if we reviewed a, a voice volume scale prior to going out to uh, passing in the hallway, uh, and he clearly understood that the hallway was a number three, then all we had to do was either hold up a number three or um, prompt him that, um, he needed to bring it down to a three. And when you realized how well this worked, you had to have been really excited. 
Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> In the first edition of the book, I know I read, I wrote that we started thinking that everything, every problem in the world could be solved via a five-point scale. So in the beginning, it just was, it was overwhelming. It worked so well and so fast. Uh, we started making scales for the teachers that we were working with at the time and through uh, and to, for other school districts. And so we finally decided to write a book about it. Who could All right. We'll pause for there for right now. And if we have a little bit of time at the end, we can go back to the video and y'all can hear about the when I was talking to y'all about how it, the five point scale can be used to communicate where someone is at. Um, that's the next part of the interview. It's called the. Don't quote me on this, but I think she calls it the home base scale, but it's based off of the five point scale. Um, but. I will try and wrap up um, so that we have time to see. But Jordan, you've yes. got um, an interest in uh, if people are wondering if you can drop the link to the video in the chat. Yes, I can do that. Okay. I'll right. do that right now. So before I forget, oops. All right. Uh, I'll have to. When I'm not sharing my screen, because I can't access the chat right now. Yeah, totally. Take your time. Or yes, I can. <sighs> Oops. That's not the link, though. Yeah, I'll get it to y'all in the link at the end. Okay? I promise. Cool. <laughs> All right. Hold on. Because now we've... Whoops. All right. So... Here we go. Due to the topic of sensory processing disorders and their associated seeking behaviors and avoidant behaviors not being covered very often within the behavioral health field and substance use fields and or among the com recovery community at large, some of the material and or examples used may be triggering to some attendees. However, the way the material is presented, including the personal examples shared, are to help make sure attendees understand this very important topic so attendees can start providing more trauma-informed and person-centered support to persons with IDD with or without co-occurring mental health and or substance use. So the severity of one's disability does not determine their level of potential. The greatest barriers that persons with disabilities have to overcome are not steps or curbs, it's expectations. And this is a quote from Karen Clay, who is a disability advocate. It is very relevant to what we are covering right now. So earlier we talked about proprioceptive dysfunction, which is the issues with body awareness. So proprioceptive seekers so these are people that would be displaying seeking behavior crave sensory stimulation via movement pressure and physical contact with others seekers may seem to need constant stimulation however they tend to become more deregulated as they take in more input Many seekers experience symptoms associated with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, such as low impulse control, inability to focus, and behavioral problems. So proprioceptive seekers may bump or crash into people or objects on purpose, enjoy rough play, and constantly seem to be wrestling with siblings or friends tend to stand too close to others or touch others without permission, crave bear hugs, <clears throat> holding hands, and other kinds of physical pressure. So how can you support proprioceptive seeking behavior in a trauma-informed way? Assign tasks that put pressure on joints such as carrying groceries or laundry, Encourage safe climbing, jumping, and contact games. And a lot of the stuff I cover in this part was written for youth because typically when we're talking about sensory processing disorders, 
they're discovered in youth and not in adulthood. And so while that might be the case, these are still reliable for use with adults. Use a weighted blanket and deep pressure therapy when needed. Give hugs, cuddles, or other kinds of physical contact when asked and appropriate for the relationship between person seeking physical contact and person giving physical contact. So a uh, weighted blanket, another one would be weighted vest. I have both. Unfortunately, my vest is in my truck right now. Um, and I'm not anywhere near the door to where I could like go grab it. Um, but I do have a weighted vest that I use to help with my anxiety. It also helps with my um, focus. And then when I'm um, overstimulated, it has a very calming effect. Um, but however, uh, when we're talking about you know, giving hugs, cuddles, or other kinds of physical contact when asked and appropriate for the relationship between person seeking physical contact and person giving physical contact. Do not be surprised if you need to teach the different, oops. Do not be surprised if you need to teach the uh, different relationships where Physical contact like hugs, cuddling, etc., are and are not appropriate, and be prepared to teach or refer to appropriate supports for it teaching this important concept. One resource might be a social skills therapist. If we're talking about a weighted vest or a weighted blanket, it would be an occupational therapist. Just so y'all have that little bit of information. So what is proprioceptive avoidant behavior? So proprioceptive avoiders are highly sensitive to movement and pressure and tend to become overwhelmed or distracted by physical contact. Avoiders often have extreme or upsetting reactions to even very mild stimulation. As a result, they can appear withdrawn or defensive and have trouble fitting in with their peers. They also frequently experience symptoms associated with anxiety disorders and engage in repetitive self-soothing behaviors. Now, these repetitive self-soothing behaviors can be both positive and or negative. So one of the um, ones that are, uh, a lot of people are probably um, used to is the uh, self-rocking back and forth. So that's self-soothing. Um, banging their head against the wall, that would be a negative. So would cutting. What is proprioceptive avoidant behavior continued? So proprioceptive avoiders may avoid physical contact with others, appear very timid around peers and avoid physical play, become anxious in crowded spaces or when standing even somewhat close to others and be unable to properly assess risk in their physical environment. For example, they may believe they can fall into the small gap between the floor and an elevator. So how do you support proprioceptive avoidant behavior in a trauma-informed way? So warn family and friends <clears throat> ahead of time that hugging and touching is not desired. Give verbal cues regarding your surroundings and properly contextualize the risks. There is a gap in the floor by the elevator. It is smaller than your foot. You cannot fall in. Let's step over it together. All right, any questions about proprioceptive dysfunction and avoidant or uh, seeking behavior before we move on to tactile because it's similar but different at the same time. Sure. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, can you see Trendis hand? Sorry, I thought you said yeah. sure. 
to Trenda. Yeah, go oh, ahead, Trenda. Go ahead, Trenda. Okay, sorry about that. I wasn't sure if you were calling on me or not. Yes, sorry. Uh, I just, I was wondering if you could uh, describe additional self, self-soothing self behaviors besides rocking or banging their head. I'd really like to learn more about what those behaviors so, might look like. So, um, from my personal experience, um, one I'll do sometimes is um, kind of, you know how when you do this, with your fingers and you kind of flick them, people might think of that as you're impatient or tapping your fingers. It's called stimming. So stimming might be something um, okay. and it should not be made fun of or told no. Um, you know, and you might have to guide them as to appropriate times to use it, but they shouldn't be told they shouldn't do that. Okay. Um, I uh, worked at a summer camp a few years ago for kids with special needs. And one of the campers who was autistic, she actually, when she was having a hard time and not feeling in control, she would take over something she could control. And so that happened to be the DVD player in the movie room. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> So you can imagine um, how upset some of the campers got um, because, uh, you know, she noticed she could, like, make the movie do what she wanted and she was more nonverbal. Um, and so, like I mentioned earlier, she, you know, they're communicating not always by verbally, but sometimes by their actions. And so, yeah, I've seen, I've seen rocking, I've seen hitting, um, kicking, um, cutting, uh, trying to take control of something that they can take control of. Um, and then the thing is that the important thing to understand is when it's a negative behavior, um, or self-soothing behavior, it's probably going to take a while to overcome um, because what happened with a camper who was controlling DVD player was before she was doing that, she would hit herself. Um, and apparently it took them a long, long time to get that camper to break that habit. So while they didn't like that their child was controlling the DVD player, cause they got how that is understood upsetting to other campers they were still somewhat relieved rather than go back to former self-soothing behavior of hitting the, themselves they're at least trying to do something different yeah yeah so the connection is there mm -hmm. um it you just kind of sometimes have to really look for it Thank you, Jordan. You're welcome. Any other questions before we move the tactile? Because I promise it's going to sound somewhat similar, but it's also different. So I don't want y'all to get stuff confused. <laughs> okay. Well, then with that, I'm going to share my screen again so y'all can see my PowerPoint. And we will continue. I think I still have to click on the slide though, so that my clicker works. All right. All right, so what is tactile, uh, tactile seeking behavior? So remember tactile is touch. So people with tactile dysfunction, they either don't, they process the uh, either more intensely, uh, maybe not as intense or completely different. And I'll elaborate on that in a minute. So tactile seekers are desensitized to touch and crave sensory stimulation via specific textures, temperatures, and deep pressure. Seekers may seem to need constant stimulation. However, they tend to become more deregulated as they take in more input. Many seekers experience symptoms associated with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder ADHD, 
such as low impulse control, inability to focus, and behavioral problems. So what happens within the mental health and substance use world, at least from my experience, is there is this belief that only autism, people with autism can have sensory processing disorders. And that is completely not true because I have both of these. I do. Uh, I have both um, proprioceptive dysfunction and I have both uh, and tactile dysfunction because I don't necessarily process touch the same way as others do, which sometimes has cost friends. And we'll kind of get into that here in a minute. So tactile seekers may prefer toys, clothing, and food with varied or specific textures, constantly touch or fiddle with clothing, surfaces, or other objects, crave hugs, kisses, and other frequent or prolonged contact with others, tend to play too rough and accidentally harm others while playing, have difficulty recognizing and respecting others' personal boundaries and have a higher than normal pain threshold and might not notice minor injuries. All right, so I know that's a lot, but we're gonna go back and touch on uh, crave hugs, kisses, and other frequent or prolonged contact because this is where a lot of the trauma happens with persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities and does anyone object to me stopping sharing my screen while we have this conversation? So that way, you know, if y'all have questions, I can see that expression. All right, cool. All right, because this is this is very uh to some people taboo topic. And I understand why it can be, um, just because of the subject matter. But it's a very important discussion to be had because there are people with IDD that end up with criminal records because of this, because they are not getting the supports that they need. Uh, so when we're talking about craving hugs, kisses, and other frequency or prolonged contact with others, for some people with IDD, that deep pressure you get is very relaxing. Um, like for me, I love hugs because it's like one of the fastest ways and most effective ways to de-stress for me. Another one that is super effective for me that not a lot of people would attribute to being um, de-stressful is um, tickling or being tickled. Um, because again, it's the deep pressure that you get. Because you have to understand technically when you talk about tickling, if we're going to get all scientific, and it's not in here because I cannot pronounce the scientific words. So if you're wondering why it's not in there, that's why. But there are two types of tickle sensations. That first one is kind of like feather or like insect running across you or like when you lightly touch yourself and it kind of like itch and so you're like doing this because it itch and then there's tickle as in the kind that makes you laugh and it's that one that has the deep pressure associated with it and that is the one that is typically de-stressing for some people with tactile dysfunction but yet um they don't and we'll kind of talk about this other uh I'm trying to focus one thing at a time, but they're both related. So you have the issue with not understanding personal boundaries as well. So let me share the white screen so I can kind of make this make sense for you all, the whiteboard. So before I started getting... Uh, there we go. Whiteboard classic. Uh, the supports I needed. Y'all see the whiteboard, right? Because y'all disappeared. Yeah, we can see it. All right. So this used to be my concept of personal space. So everyone fit in this one circle. 
And so that meant to me that I could be close enough to give them a hug and it would be no problem. And that is not the case. When you think about personal space, it's more of a target, like you shoot an arrow at, where you have the innermost ring is your family. And and um, I like to say partner to, to be inclusive. Um, so family, partner, lifelong partner, lifelong friends. And then the next outer ring would be, you know, maybe your providers, your friends, um relatives um and then the outermost ring would kind of be your co-workers and your boss and acquaintances and strangers but the other thing it is important to understand is that that diagram is fluid meaning that people can start in the innermost ring and it's okay to move them if they do something to make you uncomfortable and that's something not everyone with IDD understands until it's kind of broken down in a way that they understand. And that's kind of how it had to be broken down for me, um, to be honest. And so what happens is you'll get these people with IDD who, you know, it's great that they figure out that like hugs and being silly and playful helps them de-stress and it is a good coping mechanism but when you're not also making sure that they understand like the different types of relationships and how that type of contact can be seen by others um that's where a lot of trauma happens because that's where people kind of get accused of and i'm not saying this isn't ever the case because you know unfortunately in the world we live in it is true sometimes but you know just because someone's having a tickle fight with someone does not mean they're automatically grooming them um but that is yet almost the automatic thought and where society goes and so what needs to happen is we need to change that and ask questions as, as uncomfortable as it might be um, asking questions is better because then at least, you know, you're not falsely labeling someone with IDD that truly has tactile dysfunction and doesn't understand the different relationships and the different what people are and are aren't okay with. And then it gets even more complicated because then you have those friends that they're okay with maybe being silly and playful when you're hanging out at their house or your house. But then if you're with other friends as well, or out in public, they don't want you to be that silly with them. And they automatically assume that you grasp that. And that's how I lose a lot of friends <laughs> or have lost a lot of friends is because I did not grasp that, you know, yes, you're okay with being super silly and playful. Like, I guess technically in private, I guess in their eyes, because it's just me and them. And then maybe my family, if we're at my house or their family, if we're at their house. Um, but as far as like in public. And so that's why it's really important whenever you uh, suspect someone has tactile or proprioceptive dysfunction, that you're having these types of conversations with them to make sure they kind of understand these important key concepts. Because unfortunately, with the way society is, there's just this assumption that as you get older, you automatically figure these things out. And it's like something you automatically understand. And unfortunately, for some people with IDD, that's just not the case. And while I have been very fortunate to not end up in a situation with a criminal record, you know, I have heard stories of others who have or have maybe gotten assaulted because someone thought they were making a play on their partner. And so, you know, and the, the other thing is to make sure they understand that while it's good to have these coping mechanisms, it's good to have other ones too. Because the other thing that can happen 
and this has happened to me a lot too, is you can they can become friends with someone who notices they have very unique and innocent hobbies or um, coping mechanisms and then use that to manipulate them to get free food and free rides to places or maybe free babysitting and things like that. Um, so it's kind of important to make sure they understand that while it's okay to have these coping mechanisms, you know, you it's good to have others, but to also kind of be aware that there are people that will take advantage of your kindness or your, um, they will take advantage of you basically. And so that's something I've had to hurt, learn the hard way. And then the other st st part of this is the way human nature is your body knows what it needs. And if you're, it's not getting it one way, it will figure out another way to get it. And so that is how some people with IDD end up with a sex addiction or substance use addiction, because all they know for coping mechanisms to feel good is being intimate. And that's, and then, or uh, maybe they listen to their friends because their friends tell them to just go, go have a drink. You just get a drink or, or, or go smoke a joint or whatever and so they do and they notice that it gives them the exact same thing they're seeking and so now they're at risk of developing and this is all because no one's taken the time to help support them with coping mechanisms that they have found that you know technically are healthy when you use them appropriately and also understand the different types of relationships that they are appropriate in. And that's kind of where the big struggle has been for me is recognizing um, the different relationships where certain coping mechanisms I have uh, might not seem as appropriate just because I'm a guy and the other person's a girl or I'm a guy and it might be my friend's kid. Um, So Yes, I have learned a lot the hard way. All right, um, so. Jordan, it's 10. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to use this time however you please, but I just wanted to yeah. let you know because you asked. Yep. All right, so we got a couple more slides and then we'll wrap up. So, because I need to talk about tactile dis uh, avoidance real quick so hold on let me get back to the powerpoint click on the screen is it on yep all right so tactile seeking behavior you can support them with fidget spinners stress balls stretchy bands provide a variety of textures and toys clothing and food Play with finger paints, Play-Doh, sand, mud, and other messy objects. Build a sensory table at home and include water, sand, Legos, or other textures. Place Velcro stickers or fidgets in study areas to help your child stay focused. And practice ways to respect personal space while eating, playing, lining up, etc. Which is what we kind of just spent time talking about. Um, and again, just making sure they understand different relationships where different types of contact may or may not be okay. All right, so a tactile avoidant behavior. Tactile avoiders are highly sensitive to touch or temperature and tend to become overwhelmed or distracted by everyday tactile input. Avoiders often have extreme or upsetting reactions to, e to even very mild stimulation. As a result, they can appear withdrawn or defensive and have trouble fitting in with their peers. They also frequently experience symptoms associated with anxiety disorders and engage in, in repetitive self-soothing behaviors, just like we talked about earlier. So tactile avoiders may avoid clothing or food with specific textures, dislike being touched, hugged, or kissed even by parents. 
dislike their hair or skin being wet and avoid swimming and bathing, refuse to wear tight, scratchy, or uncomfortable clothing with seams or tags, become anxious in crowded spaces or when standing somewhat close to others and have a low pain threshold and response, respond to the even light touch as in as if in pain. So how do you support tactile avoidant behavior? Remove tags from clothing and turn uncomfortable items inside out. Put long hair up in a towel or hair tie when bathing or swimming. Buy compression or athletic clothing to wear under loose or scratchy items. Use gloves or tools to engage with new or unpleasant textures. Now, the only disclaimer I have about that one is if that sensation you're trying to help them cope with, like has them reacting like it's the most agonizing pain they've ever experienced, it is possible that that particular stimuli is painful to them due to how their brain is wired. So I would not recommend doing this if, if their reaction originally was like intense pain. Uh, encourage low contrast low contact outdoor games such as racing tag or tug of war uh again if just putting your hand on their shoulder has them crying out in pain i wouldn't recommend this but for others it is helpful warn family and friends ahead of time that hugging and touching is not desired so why is it important to keep individuals with IDD potential support needs in mind? It helps establish and maintain an environment where the individual or individuals feels included and supported. It decreases the chance of the individual's sensory system being overwhelmed, which can lead to a major increase in their anxiety level, which can also lead to increased acting out. Uh, provides the individual or individuals the opportunity to realize they can accomplish anything they put their mind to. It helps support the individuals in their recovery, reduces the possibility of traumatizing and or re-traumatizing the individual or individuals, and it provides those with sensory processing disorders like proprioceptive dysfunction and tactile dysfunction the support they need to function and not be taken advantage of and or traumatized from being uh, labeled as predator, perv, weird, etc. And then this is the links to where I pulled a lot of my resources from including the video we watched. And I will put that link in the chat here shortly. And then this is um, my website, which has more about me, my email, and my phone number in case you wanted to reach out. So with that, are there any questions while I stop sharing my screen so I can uh, drop the link? You know, I think I actually had a question. I'm curious to know, Jordan, for you personally, what did you do um, during COVID? Like, what were some ways that you dealt with, um, you know, the the needs that you have for for hugging and 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 touching, right? Uh, what was what was that like for you, and what what did you end up like doing to kind of get through that time? Oh, well, I had a weighted blanket then. So I had that. And ironically, I actually ran a lot of, I ran a weekly support group during COVID for a little bit just because I couldn't get out of the house. And so I knew other people were struggling too. And I'm certified, I was a certified mental health peer specialist. I still am. Um, and so, yeah, I guess, Trenda, I see your hand. Thank you. So I am working uh, on developing a small module for a training that is designed to help peers working in crisis settings 
better support individuals with IDD. And so think mobile crisis response teams that would have a peer support specialist on it, and they may be going out on site to and engaging with a person who is, has IDD and is in a state of crisis of some kind, right? What uh, what suggestions? What <laughs> it's you, funny you, you ask provide? that because uh, I have to. I have a PowerPoint on that actually um, because I have done that exact presentation with Arc of US. Um, oh, okay. They have been doing stuff. Um, so it's kind of important to make sure the person don't force them to talk if they don't want to, but also be willing to sit there and listen if they are wanting to talk. Okay. Would you, would it be okay if I reached out to you yes. uh, and just kind of had a one, one-on-one -on -one with yes. you about something? You're, awesome. you're more than welcome to do that. And Thank I- you. I learned a lot today. I nope. I was gonna say I think I put the PowerPoint in the chat. Hold on. Let me try again. <laughs> I will try. Whoops. Now y'all disappeared. Uh, hold on. Zoom. All right. File. All right. Here. Uh... Okay, yep, it's that one. All right, I think the PowerPoint is in the chat. Now, officially. It is, yeah. Did you want to drop that evaluation? Oh, yes, I have okay. an eval. Hold okay. on, I had to right. go grab the link. Is it this one? Or is it? Yes. All right. Um, thank you for reminding me. Because I was... Uh, let's do no this. Problem. Shorten. Copy. All right. All right. That should take you to the eval for my presentation. Yep. So, and then I can put my email in the chat. So if you just want to copy and paste it, you can. Well done. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. And if the PowerPoint didn't download, if you email me, I will email you the PowerPoint. <laughs> nice. Well, are there any more questions for Jordan? Oh, I had another question really quick. Sure. Is there, uh, is there a particular website or a link where we could find uh, more visual aids or some of the visual aids that were pictured in that video that you would recommend? Or yes. was that one of those sites that you had linked in your PowerPoint? Um, I don't think I have Carrie's exact PowerPoint or okay. not PowerPoint. Um, I have it on my PowerPoint. On my website, it's there, but hold on. I can do this. Because this is what you're asking for. And I just happen to know exactly how to pull it up real fast. So that is Carrie Dunbaron's website for the Incredible Five Point Scale. And so if you go... Got it. Yep. Well, actually, that pulls up the worksheet mm -hmm. but if you do five point scale.com and ignore the rest of that that goes to her website where she has all kinds of 
neat resources. I just happened to, to add the um directly added the download to that worksheet we covered. This is great. So I found I found the page that has all the downloadables on it on her website and I just dropped yeah. it in the chat for anyone else interested. These are really amazing. I love this. Oh yeah, I was so excited when I learned about this from my autism um specialist. Um even though I don't have autism diagnosis, it's not uncommon for people with Chun Jensen syndrome to be diagnosed with autism first because there are overlaps. And um, I actually reached out to her and got her permission to share her worksheet so long as I gave her credit. Nice. But well, thank you I, so much, Jordan. I really appreciated and learned a lot. And just all that you shared has been so rich. And I'm very grateful that you presented today. Mm -hmm.